people who love God. Amen? That we're not dealing with 3,000 people, 5,000 added, added daily. But there are people here today that love God, that you desire God. That's a good thing. Amen. That, that is that that is right there is the church coming together because you love the Lord. He is coming back. He is coming back, and the proof of it is that He would not have given you the deposit of His Spirit in your heart if He Himself was not coming back. He's not toying with us. He's not playing a game. This is serious business. And there's a whole spirit world that goes on around us that many today are not giving money to. That's right. But the reality of it, it's there. And it's eternal. And he's the chief of it all. He's the commander of the Lord's army, visible and invisible. And nothing, nothing, nothing is escaping his uh, sight today. He's fully aware of what's going on. That's why he says, fear not. Fear not. He fully knows what's going on. Amen? Praise be to the Lord. Would you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, where we have been for a few sermons now. As the Lord has been leading me into a, I guess you could call a series that uh, one has proceeded into the next and into the next, and just need to keep sharing as the Lord leads in this. And Acts chapter 4, we began there where the lame man was healed, a marvelous restoration took place of this man who was lame for 40 plus years since birth, 40 plus years begging, being carried, dependent, a man of poverty, who in just a few verses by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible makes it clear that it was the Holy Spirit, who comes upon this man through Peter and John, who says, look at us, grasp his attention, he thinking he's getting some gold or silver, instead receives a total healing and goes from poverty to praise. Poverty to praise. All of a sudden he's jumping for joy and, and excited and leaping and, and uh, uh, he's received uprightness. Hallelujah. He's received wholeness. He's received completeness. He's received perfection and that which was once cut off from the impulse of the brain in a state of atrophy that did not work, now is leaping and running for joy, from poverty to praise, a man was made whole. <clears throat> Many people looked upon him with wonder and amazement and was running too, like, ooh, what happened? Absolutely in awe that this man that everybody knew and walked by, begging daily, is all of a sudden made whole. But as we preached, secondly, there's always a group of people who can't seem to see the amazement and the wonder of the movement of God. Amen. And they're always present. They'll always make themselves known and sometimes can hide well under a cloak of spirituality until the attention shifts from them to someone else. Then their spirit is made known. And here we see the elders, the chief priests, and we preached last week on by what power or by what name was their question. They were a little on the irritated side that all of a sudden the attention and the power has shifted. We've gone into a power play, whereas all of a sudden they're now seeing all of the people running to these northerners, these barbarians, these unlearned, untrained men. Peter and John made it quick, but hey, it wasn't us. It's not us. It's this, this same Jesus. They didn't receive the glory. They didn't use it as an opportunity. They instead used it as a time to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And we find that Peter, who was once hiding, running, from the taunts of a servant girl, I was all of a sudden now standing up with boldness and preaching Jesus. Hallelujah. And we find 5,000 people added to the church. Tremendous move of God, and the Bible makes it clear, Acts makes it clear that it's the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus said, another comforter, another comforter like me? Yes. And here we're seeing the other comforter like him moving in the same way that he did, healing in the same way that he did, with the same as power that he did, 
The Holy Spirit has come. And Peter and John are bearing witness that, hey, it's not us. It's the Spirit of truth. It's the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit has come. The other comforter is here. It's his words that are coming forth. Now we find that through intimidation, they tried to put them in their place. And Peter and John would have none of it. They instead stand up with boldness, with confidence, with a calm heart, and declare as a witness the power of the Holy Spirit has come. And that this man is made whole because of Jesus. Now we come to the third sermon in this series. And there's one more after this next week. This one is the power in the name. The power in the name. The first one was poverty to praise. The second one, by what power or by what name? A question that was asked that was not really looking for an answer, but was really trying to intimidate them and make them backpedal away from what they were doing and saying. Well, just as a question is not always the real question, so by the saying, the answer that is given is not always the answer that people are expecting. The answer that is given by God, the answer that is given by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is not always the answer that people want. We can cry out all day long for our answer. Why won't he answer me? When in actuality, he always answers, but it's his answer, not our answer. Hallelujah. He always answers. It's just not always the way we want it or expect it. You probably have asked people questions in time past. I've seen kids on a regular basis ask parents a variety of questions that they don't always get the answer that they want. How many parents have said, because I said so? Which is not the answer that the child is looking for. But that's the answer that they got. Exclamation point, implication, do it. Amen? Well, Peter is now going to give him the power and the name. He's going to give him the answer. But notice that he doesn't give the answer kind of like just Jesus. By what power or by what name is the question that he asked in verse 7. By what power or by what name have you done this is the question that's presented to him in verse 7, chapter 4. Notice that it's not just Peter and John going, Jesus, even sticking out their jaw, maybe as almost ready for a fight. Want to pick a fight? Want to make something of it? Notice that they're not trying to pick a fight, nor do they give just some simple response to try to escape the situation. Sometimes we have a tendency to answer things in a quick way in an attempt to kind of escape the predicament of the situation or the circumstance that has presented itself. Maybe you found yourself sometimes in a conversation that is a little bit on the tenuous side and you just want to give some quick little answer just to kind of escape the situation. <coughs> Peter and John aren't trying to escape the situation here. Nor are they trying to pick a fight. They're not trying to do that either. They're not trying to prove themselves. They're not out there even trying to prove themselves like, hey, we're his disciples, and uh, you remember, we're the ones that could call down fire upon Samaria. See, they're past that. That's old-time spirituality built on self. They're in the newfound type of spirituality that is in the confidence and the calmness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fear is now captivated by his presence. Intimidation is no longer there presenting itself to make them backpedal. Instead, they step towards it, and they use this as the true opportunity to present the gospel. They don't backpedal. They don't try to escape. They don't try to pick a fight, nor do they try to just give some little quick, some little answer, just trying to answer the question and move on with what really matters. They have opportunity to share the Christ. They have the opportunity to share the truth they have an opportunity to share the light. They have an opportunity to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. They're not even trying to be accepted. Sometimes we have a tendency to answer things in an attempt to try to be accepted. Try to pass things over. Try to smooth things out. I see this happen in families on a regular basis when they come together and you just try to, try to maneuver and answer things in such a way as, you know, don't cause waves. 
to try to be accepted, try to get along. We try to say things in such ways that we can all just have like one big rainbow party, put our arms around each other and kumbaya, my Lord. Have you noticed that that rarely works when we try to bring everybody's standards down to the lowest common denominator where everyone accepts it, that that never works? It never works. It's saturating our religious ranks. It's saturating our political ranks. It's saturating our relationships in life where everybody's trying to reduce the lowest common denominator where finally we can all get along and it just doesn't happen. The flesh is never satisfied. Standards must be kept. Jesus has a standard that only he could match. And he didn't reduce the standard saying, well, gee, you know, they are a pretty lousy race down there. <laughs> might as well become like them. Well, his coming like us did not mean becoming sinful like us. He did not come to the lowest common denominator. Instead, he came down to raise us up. Thank you, Lord. Amen. He's got a standard. The question, by what power, by what name, resulted in an answer being given that they didn't really want to hear. They're not looking for this answer. And yet, this is the answer that everybody must have. Verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, wait a minute, stop right there. He is filled with the Holy Spirit, meaning what? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This, again, Scripture makes it clear. This isn't just fisherman Peter. This isn't just northern Galilean Peter. This isn't the Peter who was running away from three taunts as to, weren't you with, one of, with him? Weren't you one of his? This isn't the same Peter. This isn't even the same Peter who was in the upper room trying to decide who should be the 12th apostle. This is the new, empowered, Holy Spirit-filled Peter who all of a sudden, and Scripture makes it clear, saying, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Notice he respects them, their position. He calls them by what they are. They are the rulers. There's a respect there. Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He recognizes, but it's the work and the words of the Holy Spirit that's at work here. This is the Holy Spirit's work, and this is the Holy Spirit's words. And Peter is making it clear, and Scripture is making it clear, that this is the Holy Spirit, the other comforter, who is speaking this way, and just worked this miracle, and is about to talk to you. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, is about to say something to the rulers. The rulers don't see it as the Holy Spirit, but Scripture is making it clear to the saints of God, you and I today, that it's the Holy Spirit. But just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking forth for Him, doesn't mean that the other party on the other end is receiving it as such. And just because you may tell them, well, you know, I'm filled with God, do you know what that's going to do? Well, do you know I was filled with the Holy Spirit and what I'm telling you is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? Yeah, like that's going to gain points. You'll hear holier than thou, self-righteous. Who are you that you're accepted but I'm not? You want to you pick a fight? That's a way to pick a fight without presenting the truthfulness of God. Scripture's making it clear so that we know that it's the Holy Spirit, that this isn't the same Peter, and that the words and the works that have taken place is of God, oh, not yeah. Peter. But just because it's being stated that way doesn't mean it's going to be received and seen that way. There'll always be, please listen now, anytime you have a genuine move of the Holy Spirit, you'll always see the flesh arise someplace. Always. Always. It desires to glory in the presence of God. It desires to gain the attention. In this, Peter demonstrates the calmness and the confidence of Jesus. See, that's the Holy Spirit. Calm and confident. Absolutely secure in who he is. And that presence, his presence, has set up home in your heart. When you feel those jitters, everybody in this room, including myself, has felt those jitters of nervousness, anxiety, or or, uh, you know, am I going to say the right thing? Or how do I handle this? Or you get nervous. Or, and, and, and you get a wave of, like, anxiety. The Holy Spirit is always in a state of calmness 
and in a state of confidence. Amen. Always. And listen to me now. The Holy Spirit always works within the parameters of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit always is working within the borders, within the parameters of Christ Jesus. He's always operating in the parameters of truth. He's always operating within the parameters of life. He's a life-giving spirit. He's always operating in the, in the parameters of preparing people for the way. He's always dealing with salvation, redemption, restoration. He convicts in order to convert. He's always operating within the parameters of Christ Jesus. He's not going to you through Buddha in the hopes of making you a spiritual person so finally you'll come to know Jesus. He's not going to work outside of the parameters of Christ Jesus because he is the spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. He's making himself known even now. Peter is now going to direct. The Holy Spirit is now going to direct a cutting message. These kind of messages are not necessarily what the way people want to experience God. People have a tendency to not necessarily want to see God or experience God or be confronted by God in this manner. We have a tendency to try to see God more as just the, uh, as a loving, gentle friend who never confronts us but accepts us as we always are. And now the Holy Spirit comes. Look at this now. At verse 9, he says, Peter says, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what me means he has been made well, verse 10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man stands here before you whole. Notice the whole in this. Notice this whole idea of being made whole. He's brought under question, and he says, if we're brought under question because we made this impotent man made whole, let's realize one thing, that it's Christ Jesus who did this. So you're not bringing us into question. You're bringing him into question. In this, the first thing he begins with, one of three points. First, a call for awareness. If you're taking notes, write that down in verse 10. A, let it be known to you all. This is a call for awareness. The Holy Spirit desires for you and I to be made aware. A call for awareness. The Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter saying, let it be known to you all today. Speaking to the rulers, the chief priests, remember all their family members are there, this whole idea of gathering together, and they're there expecting one answer, which is to drive them away into a state of intimidation, and instead, they're receiving something else. Let it be known to you all today. The Holy Spirit is confronting. And it's Hallelujah. a call for Hallelujah. awareness. Let it be known for you today. Let it be known to you all today. We need to be in a state of awareness. Many people don't like this whole idea of awareness. An explanation takes place in order to cause enlightenment. I regularly have talked to my three kids, my two sons and my daughter, through their growing up years, explaining things not to pacify, but to enlighten, to cause them to come into a state of awareness, to cause them to understand their ways, do you, want, do you want to cause them to understand the right way, the wrong way, the repercussions, the consequences? Helping them to realize that this is the right way. This is what you need. We're in a state of awareness. You go to school. You send your kids to school. You want to learn about a computer or finances. You want to learn about church life, anything. You want to learn about the Bible. You have to enter into a state of awareness. You have to want to be made aware. Your will needs to want to. I want to be made aware, but I have noticed in ministry, I have noticed in life, I have noticed that people aren't necessarily looking to be made aware of things. I've noticed it even in counseling sessions, that people are not looking to be made aware of things. If I was to just come across and say, you know, that's really quite sinful. Who made you the judge of me? Who made you the boss of me? And we go into a whole state of denial, accusation, escape, avoidance, 
people don't necessarily want to be made aware of things. Because awareness always leads to accountability. Awareness always leads to accountability. And the last thing that human nature wants is to be held accountable. And the last thing that the Spirit of God in you is concerned with is being held accountable. He wants to be held accountable. The new creation in Christ in you and in me that is coming forth, that is being birthed by the seed of God, has no problem with being held accountable. Desires to be right with God. Search me, O God, Hallelujah. was the prayer of David. Hallelujah. Test me. See. Teach me. Wants to be aware. Wants to be held accountable. But you'll notice that when a person does not want to be held accountable, they will escape the need, the desire, the pursuit of awareness. They're not looking to be, let it be known to you all today. And immediately it's into a hide mode, into an excuse mode, into a coping mechanism of the way they've handled things in time past. Many people are dealing with coping mechanisms. The way they've handled things in time past, the way it works for them. I was watching uh, a little clip, again, flicking channels, came across uh, uh, funniest videos. And there was a lady or a husband, I couldn't see, that had a camera, of course, being America's funniest videos, had a camera and was taking videos of her son, about two, two and a half years old, who was crying on the floor in his little sleeper pajamas and would fall down and cry and whine and, and hold his face and tears coming down and look like he was in desperate need of being held and look like he was in desperate need of attention from his mother. Yet mom just kept the video camera on him. Now how cruel is she? <laughs> Not going and holding her boy. But instead she leaves the room and goes down the hallway, crying stops. All of a sudden you see the boy crossing the hallway backs up, sees her, falls on the floor, starts crying again. She leaves the room, goes down the other room, goes down the hallway, crying stops. He gets up, goes looking for her, finds her, sees her in the hallway, falls down, starts crying again. He has found something that worked in time past. And mom has just caught on. <laughs> That's what's happened. And if that is not straightened out at two and three years old, Amen. by 10, 12, and 13, it has grown mm -hmm. into something different, but same thing, more. Same thing, more. By 17 and 18, it's taken on a whole new dimension. Mom and dad are always pleasing, appeasing, giving in to, I don't have the money for that. I don't have to work, I've been working 40 hours already, and all the things that go on. The same coping mechanism that worked when they were two and three is now working today because it was never dealt with. And all of a sudden you go try to make that child aware of their situation. They're now 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20. And you try to hold them accountable why is it tough? They don't want to be made aware of what took place. But making them aware, they must. They'll go into a state of excuse. They'll go into a state of avoidance. They'll go into a state of, uh, of uh, trying to ignore it. No one will ever come to the king. No one will ever come to the so-called pearly gates and plead ignorance. I, I just didn't know. You and I need to know. The call for awareness has come forth and has gone forth from the very lips of the Holy Spirit, be it known to you all today. Why did the Holy Spirit see fit to copy this, record this, preserve this, and pass it down through the ages for you and I to listen to this today? Be it known to you today. It's the call for awareness. We need to understand. Someone can say, I don't believe that. I'm not that way. You can go into all the states of denial. You can go to all the states of confusion. You can go to all the states of trying to escape it. But the reality of it is that when awareness takes place, you are now in a state of accountability. No one who has ever been confronted, made aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ will ever be the same. One way or the other. 
You're either going to run from him or you're going to run to him. Hallelujah. But it will never, ever be the same in your life. You have been made aware of the presence, the power, the eternal message of God. And the person will always have that in their mind. They will never escape the knowledge that they've been told about the eternal one. Awareness brings accountability, and you and I must realize that that's what God wants us to be, aware of what's taken place. Be it known to you all today, to all the people of Israel, verse 10, to all the people of Israel. Awareness must come forth. Awareness. We can try to justify it. We can try to excuse it. We can try to deny it. We can try all kinds of ways to cope with it. But you and I must realize that we are held accountable. We are to be aware. The call for awareness leads to second point. A charge for arousal. A charge for arousal. Every person has been birthed with a passion within their heart. And the charge is always there, a confrontation, a conviction to arise, to raise up that passion within us. A charge for arousal. Notice what the Holy Spirit does to these rulers. Verse 10, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What? Wait a minute now. Here's gentle Gentle God, grace God, who everybody wants to see is just meek and mild and just one big happy rainbow party, says, whom you crucified. Hallelujah. That's, that's a strong message now. They've just placed themselves in the camp of getting killed themselves. These are the same people who said, away with him, let his blood be on us and our children. Crucify him, crucify him. And here they are saying, whom you crucified. The Holy Spirit is now saying this. Peter, filled with the confidence of God, is charging from arousal. Not just to stick them in their place. The charge is to cause a passion, to cause a conviction in their hearts that they would rise up. Everyone in this place has been confronted in some way or fashion. Hopefully, from this pulpit, you've been confronted in some way. Not for the purpose of ever, ever, ever trying to put you in your place but always for the purpose of causing a Christ-like passion to arise in your hearts that you say, yes, I've decided to serve the Lord. Thank in Lord. a greater dimension than you've ever known before. Greater faith today than you had last week. Greater passion for God than you had last week. An arousal takes place. You rise, you look, and you say, I have decided. An awareness has clicked in. Your passion has been aroused. And you all of a sudden are now looking for the things of God in a way that you had not. You now see things in a way by the Spirit that you did not know before. You now see the things of the Spirit where once you maybe responded with aggression, all of a sudden now you're responding with long-suffering and kindness. Whereas once instead you were intimidated, all of a sudden now you're standing firm and speaking to the situation as to what it is rather than what you'd like it to be. All of a sudden we're now operating as people of God. There is a passion in each and every soul. Some are saturating it with drugs. Some are saturating it with lust. Some are saturating it with all kinds of immoral activities. Some are saturating it with just sports. Some are, are doing it with just religious fervor. Ritual that has no relationship. But the passion there is whom you crucified to cause this passion to arise. A charge has taken place. The Holy Spirit charges them with this. You're guilty. Think of it now. The Holy Spirit is saying to these rulers, to these elders, to these people, you're guilty. You crucified the Christ. But in, by the same breath, he's saying, whom God raised from the dead. Here we have this great antithesis, this great dichotomy, this whole gospel message in this one verse 10. Crucified Christ, risen Christ. Amen? Amen. Crucified Christ, risen Christ. I've heard it preached, and I'll, and I'll state it for myself, that many people desire to see the resurrection of Christ, but don't want to accept the crucifixion of Christ. You can't have Easter without Good Friday. Hallelujah. And you can't walk in the resurrection power of God Almighty unless you have first accepted the crucified Christ whom you crucified. 
The resurrection power of God operating in your life and my life is built upon the foundation of Calvary. And so therefore, I must myself accept this crucified life. Jesus himself said, pick up your cross every day and follow me. The only way I can follow him as Peter is now following him is to accept no longer I who liveth but you. No longer my will, Lord, but yours. Paul himself said in Galatians, I have been crucified Hallelujah. with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Mm -hmm. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the essence of Christianity, said right here. And the charge is to cause them to come forth. This gospel message, the crucified Christ and the risen Christ, mankind crucified, God raised, but it doesn't end there. <coughs> Peter standing before them, John standing before them, the whole man, once slain, now whole, is the end of the message that the one that you crucified is the same one who will move upon you and make you whole, walking upright in holiness and perfection as this man is. The same one that you crucified is now risen and is the one who makes us whole, makes us healed, makes us perfect, makes us upright, where once our legs were cut off among, among us and we were not able to walk upright but had to crawl along like a bug or a worm, now can stand upright as we were created to be in the righteousness of Christ Almighty. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. In this, we realize that the gospel message has come forth, passions have been aroused, and God Almighty is coming forth and making a statement, a declaration, and a charge to cause them to turn to the Lord. But people don't necessarily want the answer. How many times have you spoken with people, talked, encouraged, shared your testimony, and people don't want to hear the gospel message? I spent 45 minutes one time talking a man to a man in an airport, telling him about what happened in my life, telling him about the goodness of God, changing lives, helping him to see that we are all sinners cut off, but we can be saved in Christ Jesus, that we're going to heaven and eternal life. And he listened with real intent. He listened to everything I was saying, asking questions, showing real, genuine sincerity, so I thought. When it was all said and done, and his time to go on the air, uh, the airline was was uh, had come, and the message came over the over the uh, uh, speakers. The man just turned to me and he said, "Well, that's the most arrogant message I've ever heard anyone say. That you're going to heaven at the expense of everybody else." Got on the plane and left. I'm trying to share in the love, the passion, the love of God, the grace that's been handed down. And the man listened, asked questions, and then blew it all away because it's not the answer that fit his theological paradigm. That's not what he deemed right. So dismiss it. Just because the truth is presented doesn't mean that a person is looking for the truth. Just because people ask questions doesn't mean they want the answer that's coming. And Peter and John are giving the Holy Spirit the answer whom you crucified. Can you imagine if you went to every person and spoke that way to them? <laughs> whom you crucified. You don't love God. Look at your life. It's total ungodliness. If we were to speak, just go around like that. But here by the Holy Spirit, he makes it plain. You are the rulers of the people. And be it known to you today, this same Jesus of Nazareth, that's right, the one in Nazarene, the one who's called the Nazarene, the one from Nazareth, this same Jesus, we're not talking about a new Jesus, this same one who walked among us, this same one, he's the one who did this, and he's the one you crucified, God raised. How could he be raised? Because he was sinless. That's why. Hallelujah. Thirdly and lastly, verse 12, shifting to verse 12, verse 11 is next week's message. Verse 12, the command for acceptance. The command for acceptance. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
the command for acceptance, a call for awareness, be it known to you all today, a charge for arousal, cause it to come alive, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. The command for acceptance. There's no other name by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. There is no other name. There is no other power. You ask by what power or by what name? Here it is. There is no other name. It's Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. This same Jesus is the one who made this man whole. This same Jesus is the one by whose power all things were done. This is the answer to the entire eternal question of where do we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? This same Jesus is the answer to it all. He is the power. He is the resurrection. And he is the life in it, all things. He's the other comforter. He's the one who said, I will send another comforter. And the spirit of Christ is present even today. Wholeness and salvation are tied together. This man, this lame man's situation now made whole, these whole idea of wholeness and salvation is tied together. They're tied together. What you saw in this physical realm of this man take place is to send a symbolic message, an illustration that it's Jesus of Nazareth who makes us whole before God, who makes us part of the body of Christ. God doesn't have several bodies. God doesn't have three bodies. God doesn't have two bodies. He has one body, the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Just one. We are members of that body. He doesn't have a variety of ways. This one command that there's no other name exposes every other thing as deception. Every other worldview, every other idea, every other philosophy, every other religion, every other thing that's being touted out there is something that's of truth or value or of deep sophistication. It's all exposed as lie by this one verse. There's no other name. Death has final victory on every person except for those who understand the command. No other name. No other name but Jesus. Some people have tried to portray themselves as the new Christ or the new Jesus. Some have gone forth and tried to declare themselves as they're the religion and this is the way. That's the philosophy. This is the way it works. Even today we've got this false prophet on public television declaring himself as, as someone who's got the power of intention and there's a ball with a light in it and if you just go to that source you can have all the power. Absolute foolishness and a lie and people are sitting there, sheep going to slaughter, bowing their heads saying, yes, that makes sense to me. What are you talking about? You put a lighted ball on a stage and say, that's the source of where you come from? <laughs> Sheep, blind, going to slaughter. Who would rather believe the lie than be made aware of the truth? Because the awareness will cause accountability, and the accountability will lead you to crucifixion. And we don't want that. To die to self. It's all him and none of us. The name of Jesus is the power. An absolute has just been made. Oh, we don't like absolutes in today's environment. But an absolute has just been made. Nor is there salvation in any other. I don't care what anybody says. Scripture has just made it clear that's an absolute. There is no other way. Why, people, why would a perfect God need anything more than one perfect way. Why does he need a variety of ways? And he didn't have a way that was outside of the person of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit always operates within that parameters of the way. Christ. The truth. He's never going to speak like, well, let's kind of yield to the lie a little bit of the deception to try to win you over. He'll win you over by saying, whom you crucified. Now, Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in due season. That's what scripture tells us. Hallelujah. The name in itself, the name of Jesus, signifies and identifies Christ Jesus. When you think of Jesus, immediately you think of the, the work, you think of his words, you think of the way. Jesus. And immediately people understand the one that was crucified, the cross. Resurrection, Easter. This whole mindset takes place in the name of Jesus. When you think about all the authorities been given to him, when you think about the name of someone, think of the names of Nebuchadnezzar, 
Think of the names of Alexander the Great. Think of the name of Julius Caesar, or just plain Caesar. Think of the name of Saddam Hussein, and immediately you think of power, rulership, Peter the Great, Hitler, Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, power, rulership, awesome presence of an empire. When you think of the names of Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Barry Bonds, just names, just titles, and immediately you think of athletic prowess, ability to be, to hit a baseball, to shoot a basket. I'm amazed how many people are bowing down to those things as that something. Yeah. Paying millions of dollars for someone to. <laughs> as much as I enjoy watching a good baseball game, I just quite frankly don't see the value in a $20 million man. Amen. I had a hard time watching the show The Six Million Dollar Man. <laughs> <laughs> and here we've got this whole mindset is I just have to say Barry Bonds, and immediately anyone who has any familiarity, ah, awareness of baseball, awareness of baseball, immediately understands home run king. Because you are aware. I can go to someone else who is not aware of baseball, say Barry Bonds, and what does that mean? Doesn't have any impact on them whatsoever. By the same token, I can say the name Mother Teresa. And regardless of your theological position, immediately a person thinks of mercy, kindness, giving. Well, hey, good news. There's a name. Listen now. There's a name that has absolute power. The name of Jesus Hallelujah. Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Absolute authority and power. Thank you, Lord. In this world, in the past world, and the ages to come. Visible and invisible. He has absolute authority where devils shudder. Thank you, Jesus. At the mere understanding the mention of his name. Thank you, Lord. Angels bow in worship. Saints praise and throw their crowns. We're talking about an awesome name because of the words and the works of a man who came, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead who now has all authority, all dominion, all over everything, from all the ages. But isn't it interesting how mankind, though you have devils shudder at the mere mention of his name, angels declaring holy, 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 saints bowing down before him in the heavens and throwing the crowns, elders in worship, and yet you have people in this world operating in the weakness of this skin and this flesh who could care less about the name of Jesus. Yeah. That's how arrogant we are. Yeah. That's how ignorant we want to be. People don't want to be aware of Jesus. They'd rather operate in the blindness and the foolishness of this fleshlight and ignore the very one that devils shudder at. We'd rather walk in the ignorance of God rather than the blessing of God. Just be ignorant. <clears throat> Just be ignorant. Don't care, don't want to know. Indifference has overtaken the soul. And instead of saying, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the one who causes devils to flee, and they shudder at his mere name. Hallelujah. Angels are Thank worshiping and declaring his greatness and his goodness and his glory. Saints that have gone on clouds of witnesses bowing before him. We praise his holy name even today. You are even listening today to the Spirit of God encouraging you to serve him and know him. And yet Hallelujah. there's an entire race of people out there today that are operating with absolute ignorance and indifference towards him and could care less about being made aware of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And yet he's the one, he's the one who will say, rise up and walk. Hallelujah. And he's the only one who can do that. He's the only one who can do that. It's not Mother Nature, it's Jesus Christ. It's not Buddha, not Confucius, not even Shirley McLean. <laughs> it's Jesus Christ. It's not Al. It's not John. It's not Dave. It's not Gary. It's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Rise up and walk as the man and woman of God Thank you, that you've been called to be. Thank you, Jesus. That's what it's all about. From poverty to praise. 
By whose name? And by what power have you done this? The intimidation factor, power play, always will come forth. But in it all, in it all, it comes forth without telling you by what power and by what name. There is no other name. A call to awareness, a charge to arouse the passion, a command for acceptance. Joshua said, choose this day. If we do not choose Christ, if a person out there does not choose Christ, as these rulers will, they will not choose Christ. As a matter of fact, if you read on in that chapter, you realize that they still see the miracle as done by them, by Peter and John. And they say, undoubtedly, a great miracle has been done by them. They can't even bring themselves to acknowledge the Christ. They don't even look at the one they crucified. They totally ignore it. How do we keep in good favor with the people that they're concerned? But if we do not accept the command to find salvation in the name of Christ, then we automatically default to denial. It's an automatic default to denial. If we don't accept, it's an automatic default to denial. I have decided, you have decided to follow Jesus. This church body must follow Jesus. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is the key. The power in the name of Christ is found only in His presence, the Spirit of Christ. And the Spirit of Christ will always operate within the parameters of Christ Jesus. There is one. Amen? Amen. Amen. May the grace of God, may the mercy of God, may the blessings of God be upon each and every one of you as you go forth through the day. Let this Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, be in you richly. Let it just saturate your presence, your family. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Call your children and your neighbors to awareness. Call yourself to awareness. Charge them to walk in, the, in Christ Jesus' the power. The command, there's no other name. It's Jesus. Father in heaven, we ask that you walk with them as they walk with you. Let this day be a time of reflection and a time, Lord, where they walk in such a way that faith increases. Bless this church. Bless this local area with your presence. And let this church be known as a place where the Holy Spirit has set up his house, his glory, his presence in such a way that people have touched and made holy. In Jesus' wonderful and holy name, amen and amen. amen. May God walk with you and may you walk with him. Amen? Amen. Please say hello to